if the car goes down two inches, your roll center will probably go down something like four inches. So your roll couple actually gets longer and you get more leverage to roll the car over than what you gain in lowering the CG. So you can actually lower the car and get more propensity to roll over than, than if you left it at stock height. Welcome to the HPA Tune In Podcast. I'm Andre, your host, and in this episode, we're joined by Mike Kojima of Moto IQ fame. Now, Mike has been a fixture in the performance automotive industry for a number of years, and Moto IQ essentially was a very early adopter of the move from print media into a digital format. It is the ideal website for the more tech inclined among us and I'm guessing if you're listening to this podcast you probably fall squarely into that bracket. And Mike's specialty as we'll find as we talk to him in this podcast is really around suspension design, sp- suspension development and optimization. and we get deep down into the weeds of this topic. It's a topic that I know a lot of those who are new to road racing for example are confused about and it's not helped by the fact that when it comes to suspension setup, alignment settings, even something as simple as your tyre pressure, there's not a lot of black and white. Instead there's a lot of shades of grey and really it's about understanding the principles, understanding what a certain change is going to do and then working slowly and methodically with changes until you've optimised the package. But you're going to learn a lot more about that and Mike's philosophy on suspension design, suspension development, suspension settings, damper adjustments, spring rates and a whole lot more as we go through this interview. Before we get into our interview though, for those who are new to the Tuned In podcast, High Performance Academy is an online training school. We specialise in teaching people how to make their cars faster. Uh, We cover a wide range of topics including engine tuning, building, wiring, but today we're really focused obviously on suspension and optimisation and we've got a few courses that really fit the bill here. In particular we have our Motorsport Wheel Alignment course. This will teach you the fundamentals of wheel alignment you'll learn about the alignment settings and why we use certain settings. Most importantly though you'll learn how to use really cost effective equipment in your home garage or at the side of the racetrack in order to align your car accurately yourself. On top of this if you want to go a little further we also have our practical corner weighting course. This is a procedure you'll find just about any professional or semi-professional team doing on a regular basis to their race cars. Essentially weighing the car at each corner where the tyre contact patch comes into contact with the the track. Uh, By optimising the corner weight this can help improve the balance and handling of the car. Lastly we also have our suspension tuning and optimisation course which covers a number of the common topics and questions we get asked such as how to work out what spring rate to use, how to adjust and optimise your damper tuning just to name a couple of topics in there. It's a really sophisticated spreadsheet in there as well you can work through to get solutions for your particular setup, your particular car. We will leave links to those three courses in the show notes so you can find them nice and easily. Alternatively they are at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. As a podcast listener you can also use the coupon code podcast75 and that will get you $75 off the purchase of your very first HPA course. Alright let's get into our interview now. All right, welcome to the podcast Mike, it's great to have you along. I've been following your journey for a long time, particularly Moto IQ, it's been a resource that I've relied on a lot and I've learned a huge amount from some of your tech posts, so really interested to dive further into your journey and specifically into the world of suspension because I think it is largely misunderstood. Let's get started though with a little bit of background on you. How, how did you get involved in cars in the first place and more specifically how did you sort of develop your passion and understanding of suspension? Well I guess like I've always been pretty mechanical and as a kid I started to, I don't know breaking things in the house and taking them apart and my parents would get really mad at me all the time. And then uh, I guess it progressed to tinkering on bicycles and uh, then motorcycles, then cars. 
I always tried to find the biggest, most expensive thing to break. I guess cars make sense then. Is there any sort of formal qualifications or education that, that came as part of this, or are you essentially completely self-taught? I was always good at math and science in school, so I have a degree in engineering from a university, so I'm a degreed engineer. I guess that really does play nicely into the suspension side of things because there is a lot of engineering understanding that goes into it, in particular if you want to get involved with plotting out the, the suspension movement, the kinematics of the suspension, that, that's going to be pretty vital, correct? Uh, yes, and you know I'm not really a suspension specialist, but I just kind of am known for it because I kind of found that there's a lot of guys that are really good with motors and other parts of the car, but nobody was really interested in suspension for a very long time. So sure. um, being a general engineering type, um, you know, I was always pretty good at that. And I mean, I even have a couple of patents for mountain bike suspension that's in production. And, you know, it's not my, I would say specialty, but I guess it's what I'm known for because I guess I like to say that I just suck less at it than everybody else. <laughs> That's one way of describing it. So if you wouldn't explain your specialty as suspension, in your own words, what, what do you think your specialty actually is in the automotive scene? Mm, I don't know. I'm pretty good at every part. I guess what I'm least good at is electronics. Like, I'm not too good at uh, deciphering canvas stuff, for instance. And, you know, like all that new stuff is a little bit beyond me. And I have to rely on other people, especially Canvas protocol and stuff like that. That's my kryptonite. Well, you might be pleased to know we actually have a course called Canvas Decoded. It's going to answer all of those questions and you'll be able to do that yourself as well. I think probably though, it's it's important for those listening to understand that the automotive industry and the performance side is is very vast and it is difficult if not impossible to essentially be an expert in all of those fields. So most people I find tend to sort of gravitate to one area and, and, and focus more on that. Now with your own sort of journey with cars, did you get involved in, in motorsport and racing yourself? Uh, yeah, I guess when I was a, in my very early twenties, um, I worked at TRD as an intern and, uh, that's Toyota racing development. I worked there all through college and I became an engineer there when I graduated. So I was exposed to like, I guess, high level motorsports at a pretty young age. I guess as a teenager, I used to race motocross and uh, being poor, you have to know how to work on your bike. And uh, if you want to go faster, I guess you have to know how to tinker with the motor and suspension and things like that. Because uh, if you're like me, you couldn't afford, uh, you know, for a professional to do it. So the, there hasn't really been a desire to, to jump into the driver's seat, you know, sort of later in your career, you're, you're quite happy helping others, likes of Dai Yoshihara, for example? Well, I used to race quite a bit, actually, and I've raced in SCCA, NASA, and IMSA. Okay. Uh, I guess not a lot of people know about that because a lot of that was before I became a media person. I got hurt really bad, uh, you know, being the a dad, uh, I think I put my daughter especially through a lot of stress. Uh, so I thought it was kind of selfish just to kind of do something risky just for fun. And so I kind of quit driving actively and then I guess uh, got back into race support. Given that involvement personally racing, do, do you think your understanding from a driving perspective has helped sort of give you a, a more overall view of what the car is doing so you're better able to to make adjustments and improve a car when you're crew chief for someone? I think maybe that's why I'm so good at it. You know, like I always tinkered with my own personal race car. If I drove with a team, I'd mess around too. So I have a really good feel of what does what. And a lot of engineers maybe don't. And maybe a lot of engineers are too married to looking at that data and they don't have a good feel for it. 
Yeah, and I think it make, it makes sense to have that completely rounded view of, of what's going on. You mentioned that you decided to sort of step away from racing yourself because you had a daughter. Although following your social media, uh, I get the impression your daughter's actually getting involved in racing. Is, am I right there? Yeah, that's true. Um, so how scary is that as a dad? <laughs> well, she's always raced go-karts since she was really little. And now that she's in the faster ones, like the 125s, it's, I get pretty scared watching her. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Must be satisfying, though, watching her go fast as well. Well, she's kind of freakishly talented at things that involve coordination. So she's really good in sports and things. It's going to go a long way in, in race driving as well. Mm -hmm. She doesn't take after her dad. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about Moto IQ. As I mentioned in the introduction, it, it, it's a, a resource that I've I've used over the years numerous times. Can you tell us, in a nutshell, what is Moto IQ? Well, we started Moto IQ because at the time the magazines were already starting to decline, and uh, there was this big thing where the whole car scene was kind of based around lifestyle mostly, and it was. Uh, you know, the Fast and the Furious and import models and that kind of thing was big in the scene and uh, show car kind of stuff. And it was kind of polarizing. And the big magazine publishing houses, uh, they kind of decided that that was the more important part of the market. So magazines like Super Street and uh, Import Tuner, uh, they started to get all the funding with Magazines like Sport Compact Car and Turbo that catered to the technical people were actually canceled. And so we started Moto IQ to kind of uh, try to capture that audience that was more technically oriented. And uh, instead of trying to create a magazine, we decided that electronic media was the thing of the future. So we were completely online and never published. And uh, that was a pretty successful format. I think we reached more people than the magazines ever did at their peak. So at this stage, how long has Moto IQ been operating for? And, and give us a sense of the, the size of the team involved. Well, it's been around for maybe 14 years, I think. And uh, right now, our team is kind of actually small and tight and efficient. It's uh, just myself and Jeff and Martin, who you know. And um, I, I think in a way, having the smaller team is kind of better. Like when we used to have a lot of freelancers and stuff. I used to spend an awful lot of time trying to correct and rewrite their stuff. And uh, a lot of that stuff wasn't that popular. So we've kind of paired back the freelancers to just the people we really like. Yeah. And uh, I guess we're a small, smaller, more efficient group now. So you must have seen, if this 14 years, I would say you, you were probably pretty perceptive in seeing that print media was going to go into decline because I'm guessing if I look at my own sort of experience 14 years ago, it was probably still reasonably strong and definitely over the last probably five, six, eight years even, it's it sort of kind of fallen off a cliff and I, I believe will continue to do so. Are you seeing Moto IQ's followers like increase year by year? They were increasing quite a bit, but then lately, you know, there's other disruptive technologies that have, you know, greatly cut into our viewership, like social media and YouTube and things like that. And I think people are kind of looking more for entertainment nowadays and less about education. It's hard to stop people scrolling TikTok. Yeah, and so we're trying to move into YouTube more. You know, like we never wanted to be YouTube stars. You know, like myself, I don't like being in, on camera and things like that. But actually, none of us do. But, you know, it's one of the things you have to do to adapt or survive. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it seems like we're catching on and our YouTube channel is doing really well, even though I always feel that by myself, I'm kind of horrible. And uh, But people seem to like our content quite a bit. Oh, that's great. 
Uh, we'll talk about your uh, social media accounts a, a little bit further on, but let, let's get into the sort of uh, nuts and bolts of, of this chat, which obviously is going to focus a- around suspension in general. And you know, fr- from my sort of high level perspective, when it comes to extracting lap time performance, and we really were talking more here about a, a road race sort of application rather than drag racing or anything of that nature. So uh, there's three sort of main areas that we can kind of focus on to, to get that performance. One is mechanical grip, uh, another is aerodynamic performance, and then the, there's engine power. And as a, a, a workshop owner modifying cars for about 13 years, we dealt with hundreds if not thousands of, of customers. And they, they always chose option three, you know, just let's add more power. And that's satisfying and it's sometimes easy, but also I, I kind of feel from my own experience on a racetrack, if you've got a car that's an evil handling bag of bolts and, and then you go and add another 100 horsepower, all it's going to do is magnify all of the handling problems that, that existed. And it wasn't until I sort of started tinkering around with our Toyota 86 or Scion FRS as they are in the, were in the US, and, and we, we didn't touch power for until right at the very end. We, we focused on suspension and tyres, brakes, etc. And, and the improvement in the lap times as well as the improvement in terms of how it felt to drive was just, was just phenomenal. So you know, your philosophy, what are those three or how do we get a balance? What, what's your sort of consideration on those? Well, if you're a Moto IQ follower, uh, you probably see that we're always into balance uh, performance, and we usually attack suspension tires and brakes before we actually get into the motor, and that's kind of like our philosophy at Moto IQ. And I, I kind of agree with that, that balance is the importance to having a, an enjoyable car. And I also agree with what you said, that people tend to overfocus on engine stuff Although I think the market's beginning to shift, you know, with the popularity of track days and stuff that I think the customer base is kind of shifting more in that direction too. Um, also in California, it's almost impossible to modify your car anymore. And so the engine modifications that you can get away with, uh, you're really limited nowadays. So I sort of follow from afar what's going on with the EPA, et cetera, in the US. And they, as you say, seem to be becoming more and more stringent and more and more of a, a problem for the aftermarket. And California seems to be sort of leading that charge. So I, I'm right in, in saying that that is purely on an engine and uh, emissions perspective. You can still modify your suspension components. Is that correct? Uh, yes, correct. Okay. All right. So... Let's take a, an example here. We've got a customer with a particular car. It doesn't really matter what it is. And, and let's say they've got a, a budget of, of $5,000 that they want to spend on that car. In terms of spending that on suspension, tyres, wheels, etc., versus spending that on engine performance, is it safe to assume that the suspension direction is going to give you a better lap time improvement in most instances than just focusing on the engine performance? Actually, the biggest single thing to improve your lap times over like a stock, uh, reasonably high performance car is tires. Sure. Uh, this is probably a little outside of the conversation, but I did I did see this again as a shop owner and, and I saw this time and time again. And it's worth just mentioning, I, I actually think even before tires, probably one of the things that's going to give you the biggest contribution to improving your lap time is actually seat time. And so many uh, novice drivers who, who are far, far away from being professional or even semi-professional kind of don't really understand that and they'll spend all of their money on modifications to the car and get to the track once or twice a year and and I always sort of looked at it and thought well actually if you spent the money that you're modifying your car with on just doing more track days that's probably going to actually get you a bigger improvement but obviously you know driver driver skill notwithstanding we are focusing on suspension so sorry for interrupting there We've, we've, we've talked about tires sort of what next you know, like tires and then getting a good set of quality coilovers and then aligning the car correctly for mm-hmm. the anticipated end use, that are is really good initial steps. And then, um, you know, like track time and then uh, usually it's something like brake pads and fluid that needs to be addressed. Sure. In terms of the parts you've just mentioned, the, the coilovers is an interesting one because 
you know, the, there's a huge variety now in the aftermarket of coilovers to suit most of the popular cars, and, and they vary dramatically, obviously, in price point, understandable. And within reason, I, I think it's fair to say most of t- the time you, you get what you pay for. Uh, so, you know, for a, a professional or semi-professional uh, coilover setup, you might be looking north of maybe 20,000 US dollars. You know, there's street level stuff, maybe at the thousand to two thousand dollar mark, and I'm guessing most of the people listening to this podcast are probably in that sort of lower bracket, the enthusiast level. Is there anything we should be looking for? Because I've I've personally used some coilovers that were downright dangerous. Like literally, the car would would bounce across the road if you got just the right set of bumps, which is obviously dangerous and not in exactly confidence inspiring. Is there anything that uh, we should be looking at for a quality, lower price point set of coilovers? I would avoid those eBay less than $1,000 coilovers at all costs. I mean, they're completely awful and dangerous, especially once they have some miles on them, like al- almost undrivable. I think for the I guess lower middle part of the market or the higher lower end or whatever, I really like KW. They have a lot of adjustability, flexibility, and you can get double adjustable uh, for a really good price point. And they're really, really high quality. I think for a little bit lower in the market, I think like uh, Fields or Fortunato are really good. And I almost don't recommend anything less than that. Uh, I, I guess you have stuff like Tane and um, some of the Japanese brands. They're kind of in there too, but uh, because of exchange rates, they tend to be a little bit more expensive. I I don't know how things are in Australia uh, with Fortune and Fields, but I feel like those two companies make really good product for the money. Yeah. Uh, especially in that lower price point, like single adjustable market. You, you've mentioned the single adjustable, and then when you were referring to the KW coilover, you, you mentioned double adjustable. So we're, we're talking here about adjustment for the the dampening, the bump, and the and the rebound mm-hmm. dampening. And this this is always a question we get asked: How should we adjust the bump and rebound dampening? And this sort of leads on to a to a bigger issue. I mean, obviously at the professional level, we've got four way and even five way adjustable coilovers with high speed and low speed bump and rebound, mm-hmm. and maybe blow off valves for for running curbs. And particularly at the enthusiast level, is less more. I mean, as I said, if you've got five adjustable components on each damper on each corner of the car if you don't know what you're doing with it you could get yourself so far out of the ballpark you can't even see mm-hmm. the ballpark would, would that be fair that's where i think the majority of dissatisfaction with high-end suspension comes from uh it's kind of like people what i always see time and time again is they kind of think uh more is better and uh they end up screwing themselves into like some corner of operation where it doesn't work very well, and then they blame the uh, shock. So kind of the way I do it uh, to avoid getting in trouble is if the manufacturer has a suggested baseline for the model of the car, start there. Uh, If not, dial everything back, turn all the knobs soft, and you always want to start on the compression side, and you always want to start with your high speed uh, first, and that's because the majority of of shocks, all the fluid flow for that side of the compression or rebound generally flows to the high speed circuit first. So if you're uh, adjusting the high speed, it kind of affects things globally to some degree or another, depending on how good the shock is. So you always want to do high speed compression first. So you kind of turn up the high speed compression until it harshes out and uh, back off one or two. Then you do your low speed compression you kind of turn that up till it harshes out, then back off one or two. And you want to do the rebound last. So okay. you adjust the rebound, turn it up until the car harshes up, out, and then back off one or two clicks. So for the rebound side, you do the same thing. You start uh, turning it up until um, it harshes out, then you back off a couple. And generally, when you're first starting, you want to make big jumps, like three or four clicks at a time. And then as you're approaching where you start to not like it, where it gets harsh, you back off, you know, one click. It's because a lot of people can't perceive one or two clicks. So you want to make big jumps while you're zooming in on it. 
Uh, and the reason why you do the compression side first is you want to run the most compression and the least amount of rebound that you can tolerate or that the chassis can tolerate. You kind of do that so the car kind of dwells higher in the travel and you avoid pack down on uh, sequential bumps. So by pack down, you're talking about if you're running too much rebound dampening, basically you hit a bump, the suspension will compress, but it's sort of held there by that rebound dampening. And then, as you say, a sequential bump, you hit another one, it bounces up again. And over these sequential bumps, basically the car ends up bouncing down onto, basically onto the bump stops, correct? Uh, yes. And you're like preloading the suspension all the while and, you know, it gets more bouncy and even worse. You want to dwell higher in the travel. So, yeah, that's what you do. And once you get to that point, front and rear, that's kind of where you can start tinkering with the shocks to kind of get the feel you want. All right, there's a couple of things I want to dive into to here just to sort of get some explanation for those who maybe aren't uh, sort of up to speed with, with these terms. So uh, first of all, we've mentioned high speed and low speed, but, but this has nothing to do with how fast the car's going, correct? Can, can you clarify those terms? So high speed is probably anything that's maybe four inches per second of uh, shock shaft velocity and higher. Uh, so high speed is things like your initial turn in and how the suspension initially reacts to input or um, bumps and things. And high speed also affects how the car will react when you hit big bumps, like will it crash through the travel or will it soak it up or will it be too rigid and the car just bounce off like a basketball? And that's all dictated by high speed. Low speed is about two and a half inches per second of shaft uh, velocity and less. And that dictates your um, platform control. So your uh, body roll, your squat, and your dive is all affected by your low speed circuit. And the low speed is what the driver can feel mostly. So that, that low speed aspect of it, we can tune that a little bit specific to how the driver likes the car to feel, whether it's crisp and, and quick to, to respond to a steering input or a, you know, dive, as you mentioned, under brakes. Is, is that right? Uh, yes. And, and the initial movement of the wheel, that, that's the high speed circuit too. Okay. But that's just as you're coming off center. Now, you also mentioned when you were talking about your tuning philosophy there with the dampers about, I think the term you used was, was harshing out. And that, that's probably a bit of an ambiguous term again for those who maybe haven't actually been through this performance. And we sort of did exactly what you're talking about with our SR20 turbo powered 8.6 a, a while back. We've got a set of MCA coilovers in that, single adjustable, and, and we went out and over, I think it was four or five consecutive sessions, basically went from full soft, exactly what you're saying, I'm no professional driver, so we were doing four click adjustments so that we could actually perceive that change. And the, there's a, a specific section under braking on our local race track, which is quite bumpy into the braking area, and once we got to that sort of higher end of the damping, and again this is single adjustable, so bump and rebound together, the car started almost skipping across the bumps. So, Mm -hmm. Is my perception there what I'm talking about? That's what you're referring to with harshing out, where the car starts actually skipping and not following undulations in the track? Yeah, and it could even feel non-compliant. Like the car like feels jiggly over bumps and skippy. And then if you're cornering, the car kind of doesn't dig in. It kind of like skims over the surface. So there is a bit of driver feedback and a requirement for the driver to sort of have a, an understanding at a high level at least of what a change in that damping is likely to feel like so they can go out onto the track, test and, and actually get a real sense for it. A at the higher level, particularly in professional motorsports, we also see uh, things like uh, shock travel potentiometers being used as well as a tuning tool. Can you talk to us about how that comes in? And where data versus driver feedback, you know, how, how you, you favor one over the other. When you have shock pots, the most, I think, at least for myself, useful thing is uh, if the car is not very well set up, you can spot things like, uh, is the car bottoming, you know, without a doubt, really quickly. You can also, I guess, like use the, you know, the advanced maths in, the, uh, in your data logger. And you can do a histogram of uh, velocity over time. 
And you can look at the histogram to see where the shock is dwelling. So the histogram should be, you know, fairly narrow and it should be um, not skewed either way. And it should be symmetrical uh, from compression and rebound. And uh, you can tell when you're looking at the velocity versus time, if you're spending too much time in each area. So usually if you increase the damping in that area, the histogram will shift. So more damping means less time spent in those areas. I, I, I mean, I find the statistical way and the histogram pretty useful when everything's been tuned in and the driver really likes the car. And uh, you can use the histogram to uh, maybe improve beyond what the driver can feel and pick up some more grip. But it's kind of like an advanced thing. And like a lot of pro teams don't even have that capability. Yeah, understandable. I mean, there's a definite cost outlay in the sensors. Then you can't overlook that sometimes these can be quite complex to actually fit up to the vehicle. You then obviously need a data analysis system that's capable of of reading those inputs, and then you have to understand what you're looking at as well. Uh, we we have had an experience with that on on one of our our test cars. Actually, was another Toyota 86. This time uh, was fitted with a set of BC Racing two way adjustable coilovers, and and I actually had a really interesting experience with that. And I think this might go for some other models of those cheaper end, a uh, cheaper sort of lower end coilovers. And uh, what I did with that was I started with uh, bump and rebound at full soft and basically went around and did a couple of laps, got some data, had a look at the histograms and it was just exactly what you were saying that was quite skewed. We didn't have enough, I think off the top of my head, rebound dampening. So mm-hmm. the whole histogram was skewed to one side. So I was like, okay, well, let's try and get that dialed in. So I added, I think, again, four clicks of, of rebound and went out again and it was absolutely identical. And I thought, okay, well, this is either I'm not understanding this, something's not right. Over the course of about three uh, sort of two lap sessions, I kept adding four clicks. And what I quickly realized was there was absolutely no change in the first 10 clicks out of, I think, Mm -hmm. 30 odd. Uh, It did nothing. And then once I got Mm -hmm. into that window where the adjustment was working, quickly I actually got it to a point where the histogram was nice and symmetrical. And that actually did improve the feel of the car. What I'd say as well is I find that was a tool that's useful for getting the bump and rebound uh, relationship correct. But then there's still the overall, if you've got two-way adjustable, you can then still go overall up and down on the bump and rebound together. And and I think that's where the driver feedback comes in as well. Would would that be Mm -hmm. a fair interpretation of it? Mm, Pretty close, I think. I mean... I kind of look at it from the pure math standpoint. I mean, I always go by what the driver says first, and then I kind of use the histogram to zoom in on it. You know, you could use the data to spot things. On a, I think it's mostly useful in a heavily aero-dependent car, so you can kind of see where the car is dwelling a lot. And, um, God, that's a whole other subject. But with a heavily aero car, you're always trying to – balance the mechanical grip versus the aero grip and um, the transition of where they hand off to each other and making that transition transparent to the driver. And that's super difficult. And, you know, I'm even learning it still. But uh, that's where data is really useful. I think the other thing with aero cars not going t- too deep because this is a massive rabbit hole. But you know, if you if you've got a, a huge amount of downforce being generated, obviously the impact of that is the faster the car goes, the the lower it's going to sit. So mm-hmm. the shock pots there or laser ride height and shock pots come into play because you can start tuning uh, packers for your bump stops, etc. So mm-hmm. that you're maintaining the, the the ride height at those high speed places without compromising, you know, the the, the low speed handling, etc. So that that's a, a huge kettle of fish. We won't we won't jump into that. I want to try and keep this a little bit simpler, so it's a bit more relatable to the majority of, of those listening. Uh, We've talked about dampers and the adjustability of the dampers. Probably the the other question that we always get that just goes hand in hand with that is is spring rates. And mm-hmm. I mean, this is again a, a pretty deep rabbit hole to dive down. The, the question's always going to be, what spring rates should I run? And I mean, it's impossible to give a, an across the board answer, of course. And, and I think probably one of the things that people completely overlook is uh, spring rate in, a, in and of itself is almost an irrelevant number. What we really need to understand is 
how spring rate relates to wheel rate, which is the more important aspect as the car's concerned. Can you talk to us about the difference between those two terms? Man, you're like the smartest guy that's ever interviewed me. <laughs> oh, I'm blushing. You, need to, you don't even really need to interview me because you've already considered everything. And um, yeah, most people have no idea. But uh, I always tell people some, some cars like the Tesla at Pikes Peak run like insane spring rates. But I always said, well, the motion ratio of the Tesla is pretty extreme too. So the wheel rate isn't as bad as what you think when you see the spring rates and look at those big fat springs in the car. So, of course, like wheel rate is always the important thing. Spring rate's kind of immaterial. There's things you have to consider, like the motion ratio. And sometimes, uh, you know, you have your static motion ratio, but then the motion ratio can change, like if the shock's tilted a lot. Let, let's explain that term, motion ratio. What, what's that actually mean in real terms? I mean, this would be really nice if we had a whiteboard and we could draw this out, but it's an audio uh, podcast, so we don't have that ability. So if there's a, a way you could give us a, 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 a simple to understand analogy of, of what that motion ratio means. I guess the easiest thing is your suspension's kind of like a lever arm. One end's attached to your chassis, and your shock is like the fulcrum. So the more outboard your shock is, the closer to the wheel, the more the motion ratio is going to be like closer to one. So, you know, if the wheel moves one inch, your um, shock's going to move one inch. So if your spring rate is 10 kg, for instance, your wheel rate's going to be 10 kg. If you slide the shock about halfway up the control arm, uh, keeping its orientation the same, it's going to be like 0.5 about because... Uh, you know, for every inch the shock moves, your wheel's going to move two inches. So uh, you're putting a lot more leverage on the shock. So if your wheel rate was uh, 10 kg when the shock was by the wheel, now your wheel rate's 5 kg. I guess that's the most simplest way to explain it, right? Yeah. Yeah. That, 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 that's a nice nice way of understanding it. I mean, in terms of those who understand different suspension styles, if we look at something like a McPherson strut where essentially the coil spring and the, and the damper are attached to the, to the hub, you're going to have a, a very, the wheel rate's going to be very, very close to your spring rate. But then if we're looking at maybe double wishbone or a, a multi-link suspension, as you say, where, where the coilover actually attaches maybe somewhere around about halfway along the control arm, that's where the, the wheel rate is going to be dramatically lower than, than your spring rate. So we sort of talk about spring rates in the, the range of maybe 16 to 20 kgs, which sound huge, but the actual wheel rate is, is nothing like that, correct? Mm-hmm. I guess generally struts are about like 0.85 or something and multi-links are generally like 0.7 to 0.5 depending on where they put the shock. Okay. Now that we've got that out of the way and that, that understanding, I mean, that really clarifies why there isn't a one-size-fits-all one sort of answer to this question. But I, I guess if you're dealing with let something let's let's say something pretty common that a lot of enthusiasts would be taking to track days. Maybe uh, a front wheel drive Honda Civic. Let's say maybe the EG or EK uh, sort of generation of Honda Civic. How how does an enthusiast know to where, where to get started with spring rates? Are they are they purely relying on what comes on the coilovers? Do you go to the massive body of information from those who have already come before you and developed these chassis? Or you know, what what's your sort of thoughts on that? Um, strangely, it seems like the market has it completely wrong, and maybe it's because of you know in the United States, product liability is always a big deal. So a lot of suspension companies maybe want something that powerfully understeers, especially in front wheel drive that tend to get kind of weird with weight transfer. So generally, if you buy something on, off the shelf, it's going to have a stiffer spring in the front than the rear. And especially the Japanese brands of suspension have a way stiffer front spring than rear spring on their front wheel drive offerings. And, you know, like I kind of think that's completely wrong. You know, like on the Honda, uh, you have a pretty extreme motion ratio, and then the rear motion ratio is uh, more leveraged out than the front. So typically on a Honda that's driven on the track, especially, you want a stiffer rear spring than a front spring. 
Now, like on the EK, for instance, with like sticky tires, with a reasonably good driver, I, I, I'd do something like 10 kg front, 12 kg rear to start with. One of the things of now uh, we can get the whole thing about front wheel drive tuning philosophy, but basically on front wheel drives, you don't want to overload the front tires. So you want the car to kind of on trail, trail throttle, trail brake to start rotating. So you could use a uh, trailing throttle and trailing braking as a tool to help the car get pointed at the apex. So you don't overload the front tires. So you want the car to be kind of rotating, which probably isn't acceptable to like uh, a <laughs> lot of manufacturers. I mean, let's be honest, what, what works well on a racetrack as well is is definitely not what we'd want on the street. So in terms of liability, I understand that, and it's probably worth worth explaining that as well. You know, if you took a, a, a car that was purely developed, a front-wheel drive chassis that was purely developed for optimal performance on the racetrack, that's going to be a pretty scary proposition to daily drive on the street, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and we'd probably run an even more radical stagger in the spring rates, like 10 kg front and 12 rear is still pretty manageable on the street. And and you could still get the car to rotate on the track, but a pure track front wheel drive car, you, you're probably going to want, you know, different drivers prefer different things, but sometimes you can get, like double the rear spring rate that's in the front. Like, I prefer not to do that, but there's some drivers that really like that. I think it's really important what you've just mentioned is there's a there's a large grey area here and a lot of it does come down to driver preference and driving style as well. You've used the term rotate a couple of times. So just to clarify this, I mean, front-wheel drive chassis generally is, is probably going to... Uh, tend towards understeer so by rotate you're talking about essentially getting the car to turn into the corner and and essentially sometimes that's it's a case of the of the back actually sort of sliding that's what you're talking about Mm -hmm. kind of like oversteer so the back will generate more slip angle than the front and um, start to come around Uh, i've driven some front wheel drive uh, racing hondas that you just uh, lift the throttle and they'll spin out so you have to like use a lot of maintenance throttle and kind of steer with your throttle and your brake more than the steering wheel. So this, this is also going to come down a lot to, to driver skill. So I mean you put a, a car set up like that in the hands of a professional driver that is used to a twitchy car and, and is expecting the back to be moving around a lot and they're probably going to be comfortable and incredibly fast. But you put a, a novice track day enthusiast in a car like that, and chances are they're going to probably spend more time being dragged out of the kitty litter than they are doing laps, correct? Right. And, I mean, even my own personal front-wheel drive race car, I, I always have to warn my friends about that if they're not used to that kind of thing. That car has been spun out a lot in the first couple laps by, by <laughs> friends. It's not helped as well by by light front wheel drive cars that are predominantly have most of their mass over the front axle line. You go out there on cold slicks and, and it can be very difficult to actually build heat in the rear tyres and start turning those slicks on. So they, they can be very, very loose in those first couple of laps until you start getting some, some heat into the tyres. Yeah. Another tuning tool that sort of comes hand in hand with with spring rate is, well, and damp is the whole package really, is anti-roll bars. And we see aftermarket anti-roll bars available in a variety of sizes. Sometimes they're adjustable. Sometimes we we might have blade adjustable anti-roll bars that are in cabin adjustable. Uh, We see the likes of some front wheel drive cars where the front anti-roll bar is disabled. So can you talk to us about how the anti-roll bar affects the the weight transfer, how it affects the, the handling balance of the car, and how we can use that as a tuning tool? Well, when you look at the mathematical model of a chassis, the sway bar has a way bigger influence than the spring, believe it or not. And people kind of don't believe it, but when you look at the math, there's like kind of no denying it. So the car is can be actually a lot more sensitive to sway bar tuning than spring tuning. Uh, I kind of have a different view of the Ally roll bars. So if someone wants to spend me a, a, a lot of money uh, with me to develop the entire setup of their car, I actually look at the uh, frequency of the front suspension and the rear suspension, and I use the springs to control the correct chassis frequency. 
and I have like a target frequency because the frequency gets too high, the car gets uncontrollable. But if it's too low, it's soft and wallowy. So for different types of uh, end use, I have different frequency parameters. And I usually like to lead the rear of the car uh, runs a higher frequency than the front. So when you hit a bump, it, it kind of cancels out within one wave. And that keeps like energy out of the chassis so the dampers don't have to work as hard. It also prevents um, like a bu- harmonic buildup of bobbing in the car, which can cause hopping and its own set of problems. If you keep this harmonic relation and if you understand the car's critical speed where the harmonics can cause the car to really be jiggly and you tune the suspension so the critical speed is at a speed that the car will never be never reach, that actually greatly, greatly helps handling and um, use the springs to tune the harmonics and then you use the sway bars to tune the overall chassis balance. So you can calculate the oversteer gradient and and have a target oversteer gradient number and then you uh select your bars around that Mm -hmm. and that's all kind of like higher level engineering stuff and it takes me hours to figure that out so i usually charge quite a bit for (laughs) for people to do that but um i've used that technique on uh some pretty successful cars like the evasive tesla uh, the Evasive 86 and the Evasive S2K, for instance. Sure. Those are some of the higher profile ones. And then um, I've had some OEM customers, and I, I always do that for OEM customers. And it's kind of beyond hobbyist, kind of, and I don't kind of don't want to talk about it too much because <laughs> it's um, my own proprietary method. But in jest, you want to use the springs to tune the harmonics and the frequency and, and then use the sway bar to tune the balance. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think really the, this speaks back to to how we started this conversation about spring rate and then we got onto wheel rate. And, and really, uh, as you've just kind of alluded to there, all of that is really to, to actually select a frequency and, and that's what we're trying to do. So... Uh, as you mentioned, you've got your own proprietary methods. Uh, we've got a, a course for those who do want to learn more about that, and we'll, we'll chuck that in the show notes where we've actually got a, a full spreadsheet that uh, the the person can work through. It does require quite a lot of input. You know, This is a case of garbage in, garbage out. So there's a lot of work to, mm-hmm. to do, but uh, then you can select a frequency. And really what it comes down to here is is the the frequency that an OE will use is, is obviously focused around comfort on the road which isn't going to work well on the racetrack so we're going to go much higher in the frequency when when we're on the racetrack so yeah i'm glad that you brought that up because it sort of comes full circle on that conversation about spring rates but yeah the anti-roll bars as well i i think it's it's an important tuning tool if you've got the ability to adjust one in car and we see you know in in car video of of racing drivers particularly in uh, the Australasian supercars series where they've got front and rear adjustable anti roll bars and you'll see the the the, the better drivers particularly on a quali lap they'll they'll be making uh, adjustments to the anti roll bar position uh, corner by corner uh, to to get the balance exactly where they want to get the ultimate performance out of the car. So these drivers are always incredibly busy and then chuck in some uh, brake bias adjustments along the way. But more importantly, it, it gives them a tool to allow them to adjust that handling balance to get it where they want as the fuel burns off. I mean, you know, you start with 100 litres of fuel in the tank. That's a significant amount of weight that's more rearward in the car. So as that burns off, that's going to affect the balance. Also, tyre degradation over a stint that's going to change the balance so it just gives that driver a tool to to get the handling where they want because if you've got a car that's it's an understeering pig or it's it's really loose you know it, it's it's taxing to drive and at the same time you're going to end up chewing up your tires if, if, if you don't have that balance so I just just wanted to to mention that aspect the last aspect of this that I think we need to dive into of course is the wheel alignment and mm-hmm. 
that's as critical as anything that we've talked about here. Again, what works on a streetcar is obviously going to be far and away from what works on, on a racetrack. So again, very difficult to draw generalisations. Uh, when you're, you're setting up a car before it goes to the track for the first time and you haven't got any data to work from, do you have ballpark settings that you apply for the likes of front-wheel drive car versus rear-wheel drive versus four-wheel drive or is it chassis dependent? How, how does Mike deal with that? Uh, a lot of it is all that, plus uh, what the rules are and what kind of tires are we dealing with. And if it's a tire that I have some experience with, I have a better idea. Uh, and then whether it's like strut or A-arm and, or multi-link and kind of like eyeball it so you can kind of guess what the camber curve may be like. So mm-hmm. I, I could generally get something pretty close and then... Um, you know, then I look at the tire temp data and, and kind of zoom in and, and try to figure out what the good target pressure is and stuff like that based on pyrometer data a, a lot. And then looking at lap time too. So, I mean, ultimately everything we do is, is, is really there to drive that lap time down. So, I mean, that should always be the, the, the final sort of straw. There's a couple of aspects that you just mentioned there that I want to just talk about a little bit more detail. You mentioned uh, camber curve uh, or camber gain, I think you might have, have, have mentioned there. And you know, what what does that term mean and how would that vary on the likes of a double wishbone versus maybe a McPherson strut setup? Well, uh, like a double wishbone has the capability of gaining uh, negative camber under roll. So like the, the tire could stay straight up or even tilt in more as the car rolls. So you could keep your tire contact patch flatter um, under side load. The McPherson strut kind of tends to go straight up and down. So when the car rolls over, uh, you could even be getting into positive camber. So a McPherson strut car needs more static negative camber than the uh, A-arm car does. I guess there's a couple of things, like if you're a more advanced enthusiast and you're already looking at tire temps, is a lot of people live and die by the tire temps. And a lot of uh, amateurs think that you're supposed to have uh, equal tire temps across the <laughs> face of the tire. But really, you, know, you want to look at maybe the inside of the tire being 20 degrees hotter than the outside. And the reason for that is um, most people think the negative camber just gives you more grip because in the corner, when the tire distorts, your tire contact patch stays flatter. But the other aspect that people don't understand is there, there's a phenomenon called camber thrust. And that's the uh, elastic force generated by the tire that can actually push the, the end of the car toward the inside of the turn. And camber thrust can generate like a lot of inward force to really help the car turn. I mean, it could be like three, four, five hundred 500 pounds even, depending on the tire and the amount of camber. So... To optimize your camber thrust, uh, you're not going to get even temperatures across the face of the tire. And if you are, you're not running enough negative camber. So that's a common mistake that amateurs make. So utilize your camber thrust. Uh, The other thing is that when you're running a lot of negative camber, the camber thrust from both sides of the car are pushing. They're kind of compressing or squeezing the car. And that can contribute to scrub and rolling resistance. So a little toe out helps overcome the camber thrust and actually gives you less rolling resistance. And people don't understand that either. Okay, now that's that's really interesting. Just coming back to uh, the, the value you mentioned, so just for absolute clarity, when you mention a 20 degree variation across the tire from your pyrometer readings, you're talking Fahrenheit? Uh, yes. Yeah, if it was yeah, 20 yeah. degrees C, you'd be in a bit of trouble. <laughs> Okay, I assumed, but I just wanted to to make that really clear because obviously we have metric and imperial listeners here. So, I mean, from from my perspective, I 100 percent agree that the the camber thrust is an interesting aspect I hadn't actually considered. So, I'm I'm glad you brought that up. Um, w- one of the other aspects when we're using tire pyrometers that that I've always sort of looked at is. You know, what we're trying to do is get a snapshot of, of what the tyre or how hard the tyre was working mid-corner where it's really loaded up and the car's compressed and, and we're hopefully got full contact with that tread 
uh, patch with the, the the track. But I mean, depending on the track layout, you know that that might have been several corners and maybe a two hundred meter long straight away from your pit entry. And if you're running a, a reasonable amount of camber, maybe you know three or four degrees or something like that, which wouldn't be unheard of uh, on the front end, as you come into the pits along a straight. You know, at that point you've predominantly got the inside edge only on the track so that alone as I see it will allow the, the centre and the outside edge of the, the tyre to, to cool off to a degree so when mm-hmm. you read with a pyrometer you, you sort of need to account for that am, am I on the right track there or is this all really around that camber thrust you're talking about? Uh, no you're correct too so it's you know like I, I, I would say that the pyrometer is something to just kind of verify what you're thinking and it's not the absolute way to tune the car around it, it's a tool but it's not like an absolute thing like what many people take it to be the, the more i learn about setting up race cars and, and trying to optimize these components the the more gray areas i find and the less black and white i, I always thought that the optimal for camber and tire pressure setting was going to be uh, infrared tire pyrometers fitted to the car so we could actually monitor the the tire temperature across the tread mid corner which is obviously as i just referred to that that's kind of where we want the tire to be working and i thought that, that's just going to be black and white it, it's it is what it is and that's what i'm going to use and once you actually start looking at that data it, even that in itself is is not that clear because of course at, at corner entry where you you first sort of get that full contact patch onto the track the outside edge of the tire is, is not at full temperature so the inside is going to be hotter and then as you progress around the corner, the outside and the middle of the tyre will start to heat up and you see this on your tyre pyrometer. And then at corner exit, obviously at that point you might start to reach some kind of equilibrium. And of course this also depends how long the corner is. On a really, really long sweeping corner at high speed, that's going to be different to to a, a short sort of chicane or something like that. So I sort of came away from that a little dis- disillusioned and thinking I maybe uh, knew less than, than when I started. It was quite an experience actually. Yeah, uh, so a lot of what makes you good at setup isn't, it's like just a mix of, I guess, experience and math, I guess. So that's kind of what makes it interesting. I think what what's worth mentioning as well is with the tyre pyrometers, I mean, most, most people probably are going to start at least with just an input tyre pyrometer. And you know, if you if you start trying to focus on your camber and, and tyre pressures to get that 20 to 20 degree Fahrenheit variation across the tyre, inside hotter obviously, outside cooler and also we haven't actually talked about pressure here but the the tyre pressure hot obviously has an effect of ballooning the tyre if it's too too high or you sort of end up only running on the outside edges of the tyre if it's too low so you sort of you can look at that variation you're measuring the inside edge of the tread, the centre of the tread and the outside edge and and generally if your pressure is correct you're going to get a reasonably consistent profile from the inside to the outside edge correct? Uh, y- yes. Yeah. So then on top of that, I mean, use that as a starting point. But as, as you mentioned, Mike, I mean, the stopwatch ultimately is is the key. So maybe try raising or lowering the, that profile across the tyre and, and just see if one is faster than the other. I think that's, you know, the, the, again, there's no absolutes here. There's a lot of grey. Understand what you're looking for and then test and find out what actually works best for you and, and your particular setup. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and you could still like look at things like uh, you look at the shoulder of the tire and if it's not rolling on to the shoulder a little bit, then your pressure is probably too high or you have too much camber. And if it's actually kind of going around the corner there, then your pressure is probably too low or you're not running enough camber. And like looking at the pattern of how the tire is wearing, a lot of that's more important than what your pyrometer is saying. The other thing I think people overlook, too, is on heavily aero cars, you have to run a lot more tire pressure. And it's probably going to be more than what the manufacturer recommends and uh, more than what maybe your pyro is telling you. Because what happens is under a lot of aero load, you can oversaturate the tire or even overheat it and and have it blow up. You know, like now that aero is getting more and more advanced and it's kind of new to a lot of us. Uh, That's a common mistake is to not run enough pressure. Yeah, it, it's certainly uh, an issue that we've seen. And I mean, I can't, I can't say it's tire pressure related. I, I don't have that inside knowledge. 
but I mean in terms of very high aero cars you probably don't see anything uh, more extreme than the likes of the open class at World Time Attack and because they are currently restricted to a, a dot tyre uh, we are starting to see a few of those cars suffer uh, complete tyre failures or delamination after just one flying lap. But I mean, it's an, that's an extreme example. Uh, I, you know, it's it's not something we would expect in in most instances. But it is good that you raise that. Now, moving on to just other elements of our our alignment and and tow in in, in particular, you, you've mentioned running a little bit of tow out on the front end to overcome this uh, camber thrust. Tow out in general on the front of a race car. Uh, it is an accepted way of helping improve turn-in, but I mean th- there's levels to this as well. Um, too much toe in a straight line, particularly at high speed, that's going to create scrub. Uh, is there a case of we tune the toe to suit the application? So maybe for a high speed track, less toe out, maybe for uh, uh, autocross style event at a relatively low speed, a, a little bit more to help turn in. Is, is that sort of an angle we can go with our tuning? Yeah, sure. I mean, for autocross, you know, I've run as much as half inch toe out to like to kind of crutch a car around like tight, really tight things. Generally, a front-wheel drive car, you can get away with more. Like, uh, I kind of found that maybe more than 3 sixteenths of an inch till out on the front-wheel drive car. Um, More than that is diminishing returns on the road racing car. Uh, Generally, I run an eighth-inch till out on almost anything that's running a decent amount of camber. But I've run, you know, like front-wheel drive, I've run a little bit more. I haven't had to, but I suppose that same trick would apply to an all-wheel drive car. And then an autocross as much as a half inch. And uh, as a rule of thumb, I never run toe out in the rear because that can feel really bad. Toe out in the rear, particularly under brakes, likely to uh, feel a little bit unsettled with a car that wants to swap ends? Or over rotating. Um, mm. So, like in a rear wheel drive car or a nose heavy all wheel drive car, like an Evo or STI. Or, or a front-wheel drive car, I might run zero toe in the rear. But a car, like a rear-wheel drive car, I'll always run like at least an eighth-inch toe in. You know, as yeah. much as a fourth-inch if I have to crutch something. That's all generalizations. A- absolutely, absolutely. Uh, do, do we need to also consider compliance and suspension components and bushes when, when we're talking about toe? I mean, for you, your example there in, in the rear, yeah, if we're if we're running zero toe with spherical bearings that have little to no compliance versus zero toe with uh, factory rubber style bushes, I'm right in assuming here that with rubber bushes and zero toe, we may actually get into an instance where we move into toe out under under heavy braking. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. Like um, with rubber bushings, I mean, shoot, the, your toe can change an inch. Sure. Uh, in extreme cases, uh, I mean, the, that's one of the reasons why, like, maybe a lot of production cars are can get nasty with really big, sticky tires, especially some of those early Nissans, like R32, Z32, S chassis, the early ones. Some of the um, GD STIs, like, the back can move around a whole bunch because of rubber compliance. And that can make things really interesting. Now, obviously, in, in a proper race car wherever possible we're, we're going to be replacing all of those bushes with proper spherical bearings rod ends etc uh, but the sort of pros and cons with that obviously that gets rid of that compliance we're just talking about so your alignment within reason is going to be what you set static uh, but you know for for something that's maybe a, a, a road car that you're going to track is a spherical bearing a, a viable solution or do we want to go somewhere in between, maybe with like a harder uh, rubber bushing? Well, I think a spherical actually provides a um, better ride on the street, but its disadvantage is that uh, NVH is worse. So it transfers road noise and road texture vibrations into the cabin a lot more. So the actual overall ride comfort is better, but you any kind of grain or texture or small impact bumps or like tar strips or cracks in the road really come into the cabin and and it's not just the uh, feel it's the noise so 
you're getting some improvements, but some more annoying things too. It's important to kind of uh, to actually understand how how significant that that can be. And I mean, I think as I've gotten older, I've become a little less tolerant of, of stuff like that in my daily driven cars. It really got drummed into me. We we had a Toyota Eight Six essentially from when they were released back in 2012 as a development car, and uh, it, it ultimately that ended up with every suspension bush being replaced with uh, rod ends, and, and the handling was amazing. And I'd kind of gradually developed the car, so I didn't really specifically notice the changes in NVH and, and that term, if people aren't familiar, noise, vibration and harshness. So just, just that transfer into the chassis. And it wasn't until I actually ended up road testing a customer's 8.6, which was uh, completely stock in the suspension department, and I could not believe the difference in, in the amount of noise and harshness being transferred into the car. And that's what really sort of made it, it, it apparent. The other element element though with a spherical bearing that does need to be taken into account is particularly if you're if you're clocking up some miles in the car they do tend to wear they're going to need replacement and regular checking correct Mm -hmm. and same is true with urethane bushings uh they wear out too yeah absolutely uh because the they have rotating going on in there instead of like rubber giving the uh, inner sleeve actually rotates on the bushings so um urethane hammers out and the other thing is urethane takes compression set so if you have like kinematic bind in the suspension like you have with many multi-links the urethane bushing will kind of get wallowed out and develop like a lot of play sometimes kind of quickly all right i want to talk a little bit about uh some of the misconceptions there are out there as generalizations when it comes to setting up a car and um, you know, we all see the likes of the the super tourists, for example, from the the nineties. In, in my opinion, one of the uh, sort of epic uh, race series that I really enjoyed watching. And these cars are super slammed; they're they're really low. And I think what that gave way to, uh, and, and then there's also car culture with the hella flush movement and and sort of stunts, etc. It, it was all about having the car as low as possible. And the the misconception that comes through is that a low car lowers the centre of gravity, a low centre of gravity is great for handling, which is absolutely correct. But people will overlook that when you just lower a production suspension setup without considering uh, the geometry, there's potentially a lot of evil that comes along with that. Uh, one of the elements specifically is what happens to the roll centre height. Now, this is a topic that, again, is difficult to explain without the benefit of some diagrams. But could you do a sort of a, a quick and dirty uh, description of what roll centre is and, and how that gets affected when we overly lower a car? I guess to sum it up really quickly, the roll centre is the geometric point in space that the car rolls about in the corner. So. You connect the front and rear roll centers of the front and rear suspension, and that's your roll axis, and that's actually the axis that the car, the whole car rolls about. And then you have your um, centers of mass distribution. I guess you could say CG, but it's not really bad. It's kind of like the use calculus to figure out where the center of your mass distribution line goes through the center of your car. But let's just call it the CG to make it easy. And so the distance from your roll center to your CG is called the roll couple. But for to make it simple, let's just say it's a lever arm. And when you're going around the corner, centrifugal force works on the, the CG of the car. And it works through that roll couple or that lever arm to the uh, uh, roll center. And that's like a, I guess, a lever arm that could tilt the car and make it roll in cornering. Now, if you lower it two inches, you're lowering the whole CG two inches. But because the suspension links and all that are like short and pivoting, your geometric roll center actually takes a dive. And if the car goes down two inches, your roll center will probably go down something like four inches. So your roll couple actually gets longer and you get more leverage to roll the car over than what you gain in lowering the CG. So you can actually lower the car and get more propensity to roll over than than if you left it at stock height. Is that easy to understand? 
Yeah, I, I think yeah the the lever arm aspect, and you know when you lower the roll center more than you're lowering the center of gravity, which is exactly what you just mentioned, that that lever arm gets longer. So yeah, the body the body roll is going to be more excessive, and I think that is the part that is, or one of the parts that's really really easy to overlook. So essentially, you can end up making your handling worse. And we're not even getting mm-hmm. into aspects such as maintaining sufficient bump travel to actually allow the suspension to work. I mean, a lot of these cars and the the sort of hella flush uh, kind of image uh, are basically sitting on the bump stop statically. So, you know, I'm not even going to get into that. The, the other element there is that, particularly if we look at a McPherson strut, and this comes back to the conversation around camber curves, camber gain, etc., when you get a, a McPherson strut and a lot of these overly lowered cars, if we actually look at them, uh, the lower control arm is actually going to be pointing uphill from the mm-hmm. inner pivot point on the chassis to to the hub. So what does that do for our camber control when, when the suspension compresses? Well, once the McPherson strut passes 90 degrees, the control arm, you're actually losing camber under compression. So as the car is rolling into the corner it's gaining positive camber from the roll and it's also gaining positive camber from the geometry and uh i mean a lot of people have probably experienced that to where when they drive like an autocross or something the shoulder of their tire is really getting chewed up badly i think we've all experienced that even as kids and stuff particularly when we were kids and we couldn't afford to do things right so Mm. you know that's something that you'll run into yeah, I, I think what I wanted to get out of this conversation is is just for people to have a more rounded understanding of the, there's a lot going on here and, and we need to understand the impact of you know just lowering the car actually has a knock-on effect to a lot of other things. So lower is not always better. Of course, there are components out there, roll centre correction kits. So you know, what's your stance on on these, um, I mean, ultimately, you know, a professional level will have a, a, a proper machined upright uh, where the lower control arm is, is supported in, in double shear as it should be, and will have packers to allow that to be moved up and down while still retaining double shear and allowing the, the roll centre height to be corrected. Uh, when we're dealing with production parts, particularly maybe a McPherson strut, that's that's not generally that easy. And instead, we get extended ball joints, which are kind of they they work. Let, let's be honest. But from an engineering perspective, it, it's sort of putting a lot more stress on that component as well. The further we extend it, what what's your take on these components? Uh, I think as long as you don't overdo it, it it's actually pretty good. Uh, What a lot of people don't understand, though, is when you put a roll center correction kit, you also have to relocate your tie rods or you get horrible bump steer. And a a lot of times, like in Moto IQ, we do an article about, uh, you know, roll center correction kit. And we always say, hey, you need to get the bump steer correcting tie rods along with it. But, of course, we always have the people that ignore that and just buy the roll center correction kit. Then we'll get uh, comments like, hey, I installed this and the car handles really bad. And then always they mm. neglected to, you know, correct the bump steer. Just, just on that note of bump steer and what we're talking about with bump steer, it happens at the front and the rear of the car, but with the tie rod, you're talking, of course, about the front axle line. And and that's just the case of, of the toe change uh, as the suspension moves through bump and rebound mm-hmm. travel. Now, I've, I've always sort of been of the assumption that, that the, the holy grail was zero bump steer. But is that actually the case? Or in some instances, could you know a, a tendency to move into toe out under compression uh, aid you know the likes of of corner turning that we've talked about with toe out being beneficial there without running excessive toe out in a straight line where it's going to scrub and, and affect our you know straight line top speed? Sometimes. <laughs> I think generally it's better like I always if I'm doing a bespoke suspension design, I design it to have as close to zero bump steer as I can. And then if I need toe out, I'll adjust it to that. But, you know, that's some of the advantages of having rear steer versus front steer and things like that too. But that's a whole nother complicated discussion. Okay, let's move on. And you know, there's a million things I'd like to dive into and we obviously are time limited here. 
What I'd like to to get some insight in is is one of your other areas that you've sort of specialised in, which is uh, drifting, particularly mm-hmm. your involvement with the likes of uh, Dai Yoshihara. We don't get a lot of information from sort of high-end drift cars in terms of, of what what needs to be done with alignment at, at that level and suspension. I mean, if we look at the development and evolution of drifting in, in general, it kind of started out again more along the lines of the looks, the aesthetics, like we've talked about with the, the sort of the stance scene. And as time's gone on, obviously the, the professional drifters have realised that that's not working. Mechanical grip uh, actually is more important than, than aesthetics. So can you talk to us a little bit about that evolution and, and kind of what a current top spec drift car needs? Well, I, I think what's going on in drifting is there's a huge disconnect between the professional level and your drift kids and you know even going up into pro-am, but your drift day kids, uh, the whole culture is very different because drifting is, to, in my opinion, it's kind of like an extreme sport and it attracts that kind of person where racing always attracted like maybe tech nerds a lot and people that are really into the mechanics of it. Mm-hmm. Drifting kind of attracted people like that would be skaters or surfer dudes, things like that. So you're overcoming this almost apathy of your equipment. It, it also, uh, you attract this rebellious type of personality that wants to be an individual. I, I, I mean, I'm not making fun of it or anything, but it's just the culture. So it's a person that doesn't like to be told what to do. And uh, yeah, uh, it, it's a really weird thing at the lower level so there's this huge disconnect and it's also this groove status thing and cult of personality thing that goes on it's kind of weird so you almost can't talk to the younger kids that are you know like are into the soul drifting or something because they think of you as corporate and evil or (laughs) they like this this kind of person hates moto iq because we're the voice of authority so does that sort of person need uh, maybe a, a couple of seasons until they realise that, that their car that's sitting on the bump stops with no suspension travel uh, actually needs some mechanical grip if they want to advance and get better? Well, most of them, uh, they think that competition, you know, it's the generational thing too. Like they don't like competition and they want to have the reputation for being the badass street drifter and they look at competition as being fascist and things like that so yeah, they'll okay. never they never progress but the more serious among them they they usually really change as soon as they start competing and then they become very very receptive to learning about things but the majority you know will never care or they have their own strange opinions or they listen to a uh, street guru and worship them. So it's kind of a weird culture. I, I mean, th- th- there's absolutely nothing wrong with the the grassroots drift uh, scene. I mean, there's definitely a, a place for that, and not not everyone wants to progress or has a desire or a budget for that matter to progress to the pinnacle of of uh, Formula Drift, for example. So you know, th- there's nothing wrong with that. But I think a, a little bit of education sort of creeps in there. I mean, ultimately, no matter what level I'm driving a car at, I, I kind of my my own personal stance has always been I, I want it to perform as well as I can I can make it. So at some point, um, you know. Again, education and, and, and looking at what uh, the professionals are actually doing can be helpful, even if you don't want to ever compete at that level. Let's talk about that level, though. So, again, what what are some drift-specific changes or setups that that you have to use that you know compared to the likes of hill climb? Can you give us a, a, a setup? You know, for for the same chassis, for example, let's keep that nice and easy. For the same chassis, something that would compete uh, adequately in a hill climb event versus drifting. What changes would you make to the alignment? Well, drifting is almost like dirt track circle track racing but it's not you know we don't corner jack too much i mean sometimes we do because of the tire wear uh regulations so we might weight jack a little bit but generally uh, a drift car we have very very soft suspension 
platform control isn't too critical, but we want to maintain um, a flat camber curve so we can keep the uh, contact patch really flat, and that kind of helps our forward bite under drift. We want everything really soft so the car can find as much mechanical grip as possible. We use weight transfer a lot, or like dynamic weight transfer to load the contact patch. You know, like a lot of this is because we're pushing the tire like way beyond its theoretical friction circle. And uh, there's like a bunch of things I don't understand what's going on with the drift car because we generate G-forces that theoretically aren't possible with that kind of tire. I think what's going on is the tire is actually molten. So there's uh, Coulomb's grip and Faderwall's attraction taking place because the energy state of the molten r- rubber is creating that kind of uh, quantum adhesion kind of thing. That got deep real quick. That's, uh, yeah, that's some next level stuff right there. But uh, the G-forces created should not be possible with that kind of tire. I mean... For Long Beach Grand Prix, for instance, where there's like a lot of good data from like the IMSA GT cars and the Formula Drift cars, and we're approaching the same amount of lateral Gs. I mean, we're close, and our longitudinal Gs are actually greater. So can you give us some specifics on on those G-force numbers? So like maybe the first turn of Long Beach that you've probably all seen on live stream or TV or whatever, that's a flat 90-degree turn. You know, even the slower cars are maybe like 1.2 degrees lateral, and they're putting down maybe 1.6 longitudinal. And maybe our car can do 1.3, 1.4, and maybe over 2 Gs forward. <laughs> yeah, okay, you're right. That that's probably doesn't, doesn't sound like something you'd get out of that tire. And, and you're talking about a tire with an over 200 wear rating, and that doesn't compute, right? But that's what the data shows. And I mean, we've even had things where uh, Dai was in the TV commercial with a drift car and he's being chased by guys with GT cars and they're going, uh uh-huh, we're going to run over this drift car. And, you know, I told Dai on the radio, hit it. And they were so shocked that they couldn't keep up. The, these GT cars are running on a, on a proper slick tire and they've obviously got a, a lot of aero as well. So they, they can't keep up with the drift car. In certain types of turns, of course, but, you know, this was like tight corners for like a TV commercial. And it was funny to see these cocky guys, like just their jaws drop. And then the director having to ask Di to slow down. (laughs) All right. So we've talked about the tire a little bit and and, and trying to just optimize that contact patch. The the, the fact that you, you set the car up softer. Uh, than maybe a road race application. Uh, are, mm-hmm. are there any other specifics that, that are very sort of targeted only towards a, a drift setup that, that you can share with us? Uh, probably like a run, like a flatter camber curve with less camber gain, uh, less anti, uh, very neutral toe curve. Probably run, put more emphasis on geometric anti roll. Um, so we can get away with a, uh, really soft car but the platform is controlled because i don't know if you watch formula drift on tv but if you ever notice like you notice how dice car looks like really controlled and fluid and it's not affected by bumps and you don't see it like looking twitchy or healing over a lot of that's um because we use a lot of geometric anti-roll i guess click clarify that term geometric anti-roll so our, our roll center and CG, our roll couple, is, is shorter. So there's just not the tendency of the car to, to roll when lateral G-force is applied. Right. There's kind of like a fine line because if you make your roll center too high, the car will tend to jack in the corners. So it's getting that right point to where your roll's minimized, but you're not getting any jacking. Uh, the sign that the car is jacking is under cornering load, the car goes up instead of lean. Yeah, okay. And this is really all to do with your suspension pickup points and, and where you've got those located on the, the chassis uh, yes. to, to get that roll centre location correct. Yes, and with Formula Drift, we're kind of limited by the rules and where we can do it on the chassis side. But on the upright side, we have unlimited flexibility. And that's something that we learned over the years that seems to work. In terms of tunability, you know, 
I, I assume that you don't go to every track and just run the, the same setup out of the box. Do, do you need to make wholesale changes or does it stay pretty close? Uh, no, there's usually a kind of a big difference from track to track. And what would influence those? That like what what's what's the style of the track that would affect the the setup you go with? I guess a big one is um, the type of track. Like you have high speed ovals like Seattle or Irwindale, and they require something really different. There's other tracks with big bumps like maybe Orlando, where you're coming off a bank turn through a big transition. The center of the infield part of the course is really really bumpy. Different courses like Long Beach, the asphalt has a really high uh, mew, so the asphalt itself is really grippy. There's tracks like Irwindale, too, where the grip of the asphalt changes quite a bit over the course of the day. So during the day, it tends to be greasy, but at night, it grips up considerably, so you have to be ready for that. So in drifting, there's probably more fiddling with the suspension than maybe any other motorsport. Okay. I, I think probably to the uninitiated that wouldn't be expected. But I mean, you know, at, at the level professional drifting is, it's probably also no surprise. I mean, no two events are, are obviously the same. Oh, the tracks are so different. You know, like road courses, there's way less variation. And I guess ovals, maybe there's less variation. But for drifting, we could be on a a parking lot based course or we could be on a you know like a street road course or we could be on the road course or we could be on the big oval or a small oval or tracks that are hybrids of all three and you can run into smooth and bumpy on the same course so yeah i I think we run over a, a big different varying degrees of surfaces i mean the only thing it probably does more is a rally car no, fair enough. When you explain it like that, obviously, yes, there's a lot of variation that is going on, so so that all does make sense. Look, Mike, I'd love to keep chatting. I'm sure we could go probably for, for another hour, but I do want to respect your time. So I think we, we'll move towards wrapping this up, and we have the same three questions that we like to ask all of our guests. Uh, the first of those is, what's next in the future for, for you and perhaps Moto IQ? Well, uh, Moto IQ, we're going... Uh, more and more toward uh, video as our media. I kind of feel like uh, none of us particularly wanted to be in video. So our big mistake was not adopting it sooner where uh, you guys were primarily video from the beginning and uh, you're a little bit ahead of your time, but uh, now you're right in the fat part of the market. And now, uh, you know, like we're really established on the web, but the not too many people know us in the video domain. So we're like launching the brand in video and trying to play catch up. You know, we're kind of not like the guys that like to be out front like that, but I guess you have to learn to adapt, right? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think I, I probably share that that same viewpoint, uh, you know, particularly at the start uh, being on videos, it's it's a little bit scary but I, I guess you get more comfortable a, as time goes on so yeah uh, and I think also you, you don't have to be a movie star here the content that you're producing is for a purpose and people are appreciating that purpose so yeah a, a slightly more informal approach is, is totally fine I think for the type of viewer that that you would get or, or, or we get that that's how I see it anyway hopefully I'm right and our next question Mike <sighs> Is there any advice that you could give to maybe our, our listeners who are a little bit younger and maybe looking at a career in the automotive industry, maybe sort of in the same direction you've gone through? Given your experience to date, is there anything, any advice you would give that uh, maybe would help them avoid some pitfalls or fast track their experience and career? I would say motorsports is very passion based, but it's very difficult to make a good living. So for most young people, it's probably best not to be all consumed by it and make it your like lifestyle. And to be honest, very few people like from driving to even the technical side can make a good living. It's probably less than 5% of all the people that want to. And for drivers, it's probably one tenth of 1% that can actually make it. So I think my advice to young people is to be realistic and then to realize that Driving in motorsports is probably going to be your hobby. 
And there's nothing wrong with being very good at your hobby, but you should always have like a fallback. So, you know, get your education, get a good job, develop your career, uh, use that to pursue your passion to a high degree. And if you're good enough at it, uh, you'll be recognized and maybe you, it can become your full-time deal. But, you know, that's very rare. And then if your full-time deal in motorsports doesn't work out, you can always have a different skill set to fall back on. I just say this because I've seen so many people that have kind of ruined their lives because they got caught up in it, and it's kind of like a drug. And it's best to be realistic. Yeah, I think that's that's really solid advice. And I mean, particularly the the path that you've gone down yeah, the the engineering degree obviously is applicable to to a range of different areas of expertise. So you, you would have had that fallback if if that's the way things had gone. You could probably never go wrong with education at that level because it's just applicable across the board, and and employers are and companies are going to be looking for that sort of a qualification. All right, our last question for today, Mike. If people want to follow you and see what you're up to, uh, how should they do so? So what are what are your social media tags? Uh, well, the main one is to look at Moto IQ's uh, social media stuff, which is pretty easy to find. Uh, go to our website, read our stuff, go to our YouTube channel, subscribe, and follow us on Instagram. And uh, I think you'll have a lot of fun and like what you see. Definitely. I, I can't say enough good stuff about Moto IQ and uh, we will put links to all of those uh, areas, those accounts and your website in our show notes so people can check there to, uh, to find out more. All right, it's been a great chat, Mike. Uh, always uh, fun having to talk to you about suspension and we really appreciate your time today and uh, hopefully we might be able to catch up in person at PRI later in the year if you're around. So we'll probably see you at the expo there and drink all the free beer, right? <laughs> That's the one. All right. Thanks again, Mike. We'll see you soon. All right. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of Tune In with Mike Kojima, we'd love it if you could drop a review on your chosen podcasting platform. These reviews really help us to grow our audience and that in turn helps us to continue to get more high quality guests. To say thanks, each week we'll be picking a random reviewer and sending them out an HPA t-shirt free of charge anywhere in the world. Also, this is a great place to ask any questions you might have too and I'll do my best to answer them if your review gets picked. So this week a big shout out to Alex who said awesome guests when I'm working on my RX7 in the garage it is lore that an HP Academy podcast is playing. Great feedback there Alex really glad to hear that you are enjoying the podcast and good luck on getting that RX7 finished and out of the garage. If you get in touch with your t-shirt size and your shipping details we'll fire off a fresh tee straight out to you. All right, that concludes our interview and before we sign off I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialise in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember you've got that coupon code, you can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 70 $75 off the purchase of your first course. You'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. Important to mention that when you purchase a course from us, that course is yours for life as well. It never expires. You can rewatch the course as many times as you like, whenever you like. The purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership. That gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.